evening. Good evening. That was wonderful music. Thank you so much for that. That was really cool. Um, I want to welcome everybody who's here tonight. I am Maven uh, of Mythgard. And it's been a while, I think, since we've... No, has it been? A, no, it's been a while since I've been here. We had class last week, but I wasn't here. So, um, so Narnian is ready to roll, right? We're ready to roll tonight? We're ready. We're ready. Okay. All right. Yay, Nar- yes. Yay Narnian. All right. <laughs> I'll be back a little later with, uh, with uh, field trip stuff. But in the meantime, I will be in the back. Excellent. Very good. Thank you for that. And we are ready to go. This is class number 20 now. Uh, so we've now spent 20 classes. And uh, just for the record, we have no hope of finishing chapter five today. That's just not going to happen. So um, I, I, I suspect that we're going to um, uh, we're going to be able to get through chapter five in the next class, which would be 21 uh, uh, weeks. So, yes, I think we're on pace. Uh, we're on pace to finish the Fellowship of the Ring sometime in 2018. So that'll be great. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to get back to talking about the conspiracy tonight. Um, the topic, uh, the, the title of tonight's class is Trusty and Willing, remembering uh, Sam's words, of course, that we're going to get to as he is thinking of both Gandalf and Gilder's advice about whom they should take. Uh, so we'll be seeing the conspiracy on the one hand and uh, the advice that Frodo has been given in Gilder's case grudgingly, of course, as we will recall. Um, so we're going to get back to uh, that. A couple quick announcements to begin. Uh, first, I just wanted to mention again, I know I've been announcing this, but it's getting closer now, our Hobbit Immersion Camp. So um, I just wanted to share with you for a second here on the stream, you're, you'll be able to see. Uh, this is the Hobbit Immersion Camp events page, and if you scroll down, we have a new feature, uh, which is a map. An interactive map where you can see all the different locations that are hosting chapters currently of our Hobbit Immersion Camp. So if you find one of these near you, you can join in already, and that's great. If you don't, well, try to make one happen. If you want, if you've got kids and you want uh, your kids or you know kids uh, who should uh, uh, participate in a in a in a in an awesome free two week camp to really immerse themselves in Middle Earth and get to know the Hobbit really well. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of fun to be had. You can do it on your own. If you want to get together with a couple other families and do a group yourself, you can totally do that. Um, you can sign up. Uh, so just uh, go ahead and fill out the library registration form here um, for any kind of group uh, that you'd like to do. So uh, we definitely want as many people as possible to be able to participate. We're going to have a really, really good crowd, uh, which I'm super excited about. So um, anyway, so that's the Hobbit Immersion Camp, and it starts on July 10th, so we're only a couple weeks away from the beginning of Hobbit Immersion Camp, and as I say, there's still time uh, to get signed up uh, if you would like to do that. Uh, other thing, this is a, 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 a well, time frame-wise, it'll be uh, somewhere around the same time, actually, um, but a little advanced warning for our next Mythgard Academy uh, uh, discussion that we're going to be having. We're finishing up Boethius, Consolation of Philosophy, soon. Uh, I hope to be able to do that in two more weeks. We're at one tomorrow and then one next week. But we're um, uh, after that, we're going to be shifting to The Treason of Isengard, book two of the History of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so that was, the, the Return of the Shadow class was just awesome. Uh, getting to go through the earliest manuscript drafts of the Fellowship of the Ring as Tolkien began to think his way through and kind of feel his way uh, through the story. Um, so there's still time. We're a few weeks away from The Treason of Isengard. If you want to get started reading, you can. If you didn't, get to do the Return of the Shadow class. There's time now. You can uh, go back and catch up on your reading. Uh, you can watch the Return of the Shadow classes on YouTube or listen to them uh, on our Mythgard Academy podcast feed, which you can find on iTunes. Uh, so I strongly recommend it. I know that some people kind of uh, I, I mean, I, I've, I've known many people who have deliberately stayed away from uh, the history of the of the Lord of the Rings. But, you know, they don't think it's sort of don't want their vision of the of the completed product to be sort of uh, you know kind of tainted by all these other things and and to sort of see the the earlier stages that get rejected and stuff. I know some people don't like that kind of thing. 
I strongly recommend that you give it a shot because it is so brilliant to see the story unfolding. It's uh, It's been tremendous fun uh, and you really come to appreciate many things about the final story more. I, I mean, I find myself just amazed, um, sort of, uh, you know, amazed anew at the... Um, uh, at the complexity of of the Lord of the Rings uh, and what he accomplished. So, anyway, it's um, it's it's really fun. So um, I'm I, I encourage you to get yourself ready. Treason of Isengard will be starting that right about the middle of July. So uh, get yourself ready for that. All right. Um, let us move on to notes and queries. We have a few comments uh, on the discussion board that I wanted to talk about and share. This is our discussion board on lotro.mythgard.org. And uh, here we are. So, okay. Gravity. Uh, has a, a question. In a previous class, we, when we discussed the Nazgul's interactions with Maggot, a question came up about the Nazgul's behavior. Specifically, why was the Nazgul being polite to Maggot? Right? Yeah, we talked about that. Like, why didn't you just, just rip him up to begin with or torture him? Um, I think it's possible that this Nazgul is feigning politeness. I find it unlikely that the Nazgul are stupid, in which case they know that arming the Shire against them would make their task more difficult. Attacking Maggot or doing anything to raise alarm would be noticed by a lot of hobbits who are likely nearby, which would not be helpful to the Nazgul's cause. But even more significant is the fact that they work for a guy with the title The Deceiver. It seems very likely that the Nazgul are emulating their boss. It also seems likely that Sauron learned this strategy from his boss. Here's a quote from from the Silmarillion, and Morgoth sent out his spies, and they were clad in false forms, and deceit was in their speech, and they made lying promises of reward. Couldn't the Nazgul's politeness simply be a deceit to try and elicit help from Maggot? Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely think that that's what's happening there. Um, I certainly don't think that they're being polite because they need to. Um, certainly... The Nazgul who confronts Farmer Maggot, or whom Farmer Maggot confronts, perhaps I should say, um, could certainly take out uh, uh, Farmer Maggot if he chose to. I, I don't think there's any real question about that. Um, but it, I, I agree that it is certainly in his interest uh, not to do that. Um, on the one hand, uh, you know, I... I don't think they could necessarily just storm their way through the Shire, slaughtering every hobbit that they've, you know, like engaging in hobbit genocide and hoping just to kill Baggins while they're at it, right? At the very least, that would be a terribly inefficient way uh, for them to proceed. So it does seem uh, that they're, they're, you know, they, they, they proceed both by fear and intimidation and by... Um, promises of reward, right? Um, uh, sort of this, that exact kind of deception. Now, fear and intimidation, you'll notice, is not their number one ploy, right? It's not their, their, their go-to ploy. We see that happening in other places, right? Uh, we will see, for instance, some fear and intimidation at work in the Bree land when we get there. But it's interesting, I think, um, that they don't do that with the hobbits. The, the the his number one approach, the Nazgul's number one approach with Farmer Maggot, is not first just to terrify him and cow him into answering. Um, it's to to wheedle, right? You know, it's to 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 be polite, try to get him to help. He even promises to bribe him, right, or offers a bribe. Um, uh, and gravity. That's a great Silmarillion quote. Um, obviously relevant. Lying promises of reward. Uh, one wonders. How like did they bring lots of huge chests of gold with them from Mordor, right? Uh, uh, in order to bribe their way around Eriador, right? Trying to find Baggins, uh, maybe they did. You know, maybe they have pack horses uh, laden down with gold. But I rather doubt it, right? I rather doubt it. I rather suspect uh, that they're lying when they're offering to pay gold. Um, so um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, one thing that's kind of interesting to me is the fact that, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, um, we don't really see any hobbits on whom the fear and intimidation thing works, right? Um, that is, we've seen the Black Riders interact verbally with two hobbits, or rather heard about it secondhand in both cases, uh, Gaffer Gamgee and Farmer Maggot, and neither one of them, uh, both of them were uh, 
pretty uppity and cheeky in their dealings with the Nazgul. So, uh, you know, it seems certainly that the flattery thing is a is a better strategy. And I agree, Gravity, more in line with Sauron's general approach. Um, but I do also think that it has something to do with the Hobbits, too. They're trying to do a hard thing, right? They're not just trying to find the land of the Hobbits. That was hard enough. They're instead trying to uh, find one hobbit out of all of the hobbits in the Shire once they find that land, right? Uh, and without the cooperation of the other inhabitants, um, they're going to have a difficult time doing that. Um, so I agree, that makes all kinds of sense. Um, Freda asks, what about Fatty Bulger? Well, we'll get to him. We'll get to him and see what happens there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Let's keep going. Uh, Frosty of Foric Hell asks, uh, Frodo's correction of looking to searching, so this is in uh, uh, Frodo's uh, conversation with the conspirators last time, one of the, the I think the second to last slide we looked at last time, uh, led me to investigate the etymology. Always a good idea when the author is a philologist. Look means simply to use one's eyes to see. So far, the writers, to look for Frodo, um, so, so for the writers to look for Frodo would be to stop when they see him. As they have no visible eyes, this may also lead to Frodo's uh, emendation, as was suggested by the discussion of sniffing during the class session. Search, however, is ultimately from the Latin meaning to go around. Thus, uh, uh, Prof. Olson is likely correct that it implies more of a hunt. To search is not merely to find, but to return whence you came, likely bringing your quarry with you. Come back to Mordor, we will take you. Also of note is that search comes to English by Latin through French, while look is Germanic. Knowing Tolkien's preference for words of earlier origin, this amuses me. Surely the servants of the enemy bring with them foul words of foreign origin, diluting the purity of good English words. I, I like that. I like that. That idea that, uh, uh, that Frodo shifts from looking to searching uh, because searching is one of those newfangled foreign words uh, in origin, ultimately. Uh, and so more fitting to use to... Uh, to uh, describe the agents of the enemy, uh, I think that's uh, I think that's kind of cool. Um, but uh, anyway, um, uh, I yes, so I, this def that definitely you know Frosty seems to confirm uh, what I was uh, what I was thinking about the shift. I think it seems to me that there are two things that underlie that shift in Frodo's mind. Right, one is the. Uh, of the really simple kind of superficial thing, right? You know, that like they're looking, oh, oh wait, actually they can't seem to be smelling instead of looking, right? So maybe I should use the word, the more general word searching, um, not tied to any particular sense, right? Um, on the one hand, that seems to be, um, uh, that seems to be one of the things that, uh, that, that is going on there. But I do also think that, you know, that business of, of uh, of going around and hunting, right? They're they're not just looking. They're not just kind of, you know, looking around. Uh, they are hunting for me, um, and they're not going to stop until they find me. Um, and in that sense, I do think that searching. Uh, he he s seems to land on that because searching fits it better as well. Um, so absolutely. Okay. Uh, quick note from Steve. I'm curious about uh, uh, water hot. I'm curious if there could be a subtle reference to tea in the English custom going on in the bath song. To me, the sound of hot water pouring into a cup is always a little different from the sound of cold water. In discussing the bath song, I agree it seems to be moving from descriptions of sound to descriptions of images, but I wonder if there is a layer in which sound is still involved in the steaming hot water. I hadn't thought of that, Steve, but of course you're absolutely right. The sound of hot water pouring into a cup is not only a different so sound from the sound of cold water pouring into a cup, but it is a particular particularly pleasant sound and associated with all kinds of wonderful things right now of course uh in the context of an old-fashioned bath that is to say a bath without indoor plumbing uh that pouring of hot water into a tub would also uh partake of that same uh hot water sound right um so uh so i love that i i, I think that that's um that's a great point, and it's a a sound associated with steamy water that I had not uh, that I had not considered. 
Uh, let's see. SR Perry is asking, how big is a Hobbit bath? That's a good question. I don't really know. I, I, I'm assuming that it's like a copper tub, right? Probably not the same size that humans would use because you don't need to make it that big. And uh, clearly small enough, um, clearly small enough that they have... Uh, uh, individual baths, right? There are three bathtubs uh, in, you know, notice first they're assuming that they were going to have to race for the tub, right? That they're going to have to take turns in the tub. And secondly, then like there were three tubs made, you know, uh, set out one for each of them. So clearly these are designed to be one man tubs, right? So they're quite, they're fairly small, um, but also obviously uh, large enough to luxuriate in as, um, you know, there's uh, plenty of references in the song to the luxuriating, and even to uh, uh, I would I, w- I would think um, they must be they're cl- they cl- they're clearly long enough to recline in nicely, or else you couldn't splash the water with your feet in the way that's described in the final lines of the song, right? Um, and I uh, see because so pumpkin muffin no, see I don't think the hobbits do have bathhouses anything like Romans. Um, for Romans, bathing was a communal experience. Uh, you know, I mean, it was it was a it was a very public social thing that they did. Um, the fact that the three of them are all able to take a bath at the same time together is treated as a novelty um, by the hobbits. Again, they all assume that it's uh, they're going to have to either go by eldest first or quickest first. Um, you know, whether a formal or informal uh, uh, order, but but that. Uh, that kind of the, the the social experience that they end up having, all being able to bathe together, uh, and uh, you know enjoying the bath song and splashing, was clearly not uh, very far from their from their assumptions. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, uh, yeah. Simon asks says, uh, speaking of hobbit sizes, aren't they between two and four feet tall? Yes, that's what it says, and. It's true. Two feet is really tiny. Uh, you know, as Simon says, his uh, one and a half year old daughter uh, is is over two feet tall already. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. They're very. T- remember, uh, I mean, all of the references to children, right? Um, that's not to say babies. Um, you know, well, no, we find our hobbits are taller than two feet, right? You know, we'll get to the actual measure later on. Um, they can stand with children, um, not toddlers, right, but children and uh, sort of fit in amongst the boys. Um, but, the, you know, I, I'm thinking, of course, especially of Burgil uh, in, uh, in Minas Tirith, where we actually get the dimensions, you know, we get uh, the exact height of Pippin. Um, but uh, so they're not, the hobbits in this book are not two feet tall, but apparently that's possible, right? So like a, a two foot tall hobbit you know, if that's the lower bound, it would be like, you know, the equivalent of, you know, something like a, you know, uh, a sub five foot, you know, human, like a, you know, a four foot eight inch woman or something like that, right? That would be, you know, uh, um, what a, a two foot tall hobbit would be, essentially, it seems. Um, so, um, yeah, cool. Oh, Lady Schmidt. Schmebulok says her boyfriend and, and she are dressing up uh, her nephew as a hobbit for the ring bearer to be the ring bearer in their wedding. That's kind of cool on multiple levels. Just don't get the don't get the 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 ring of power thing inscribed on your wedding ring. Like it's super tempting, I know, because it's so beautiful, right? The script is so beautiful, um, but like if you think about it, it's super creepy. Right. Just like you don't want that. Like who would want that on their wedding band? Right. It reminds me of, um, uh, uh, you know, Tolkien wrote in one of his letters like he had been, you know, he was given many gifts by fans and stuff. You know, got a lot of fan mail and fan gifts in his later years. Uh, And and, you know, he he mentions how one of the uh, one of his fans sent him a cup, like a a pewter goblet uh, with, in his words, the horrible ring um, inscription, uh, around the edges of it. And he wouldn't use it because it's evil. Like, you know, he, 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 uh, he says he used it as an ashtray, uh, because that was like, what seemed to him the fitting way to handle this thing that was, uh, uh, inscribed with, you know, the words of Sauron. So, um, I, I can only imagine what he would have to say about that whole trend, which was, you know, kind of a thing a few years back, you know, when the Peter Jackson movies were fresher of, uh, you know, couples getting the, the ring inscription on their wedding bands. I just can't. I just can't. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Cool. Anyway. Um, uh, yes, exactly. Lady Shmebulak, you get, use the script, right? Get some Elvish on the rings. That's awesome, right? No, nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, just n not one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them. Like, no. <laughs> no, please, no. All right. Okay, well, let's move back here into, uh, into the conspiracy. All right. So, uh, first... A little synopsis of where we've of where we've been. So okay, so remember, the conversation begins with Frodo hemming and hawing, not sure what to reveal or how to reveal it, right? Uh, and he's kind of stalling for time and uh, you know not saying anything and then kind of saying too much. We looked at that um, when he finally does say something. Remember what he emphasizes um, is the danger, right? So when when uh, when when they push him. Uh, you know, he doesn't say anything at first. He tries not to respond. And then they push him like, you know, you, you should at least tell us whether you think Farmer Maggot's guess good or bad. Right. And he's like, it's a good guess as far as it goes, but he doesn't know anything. Right. And then he emphasizes um, it's no joke. Right. And I think that I'm not safe here or anywhere. Right. So his, he, he, he immediately emphasizes like this. There is serious danger going on here. That's that's his primary point. Like he's trying to impress them with the seriousness of the situation. Now, remember, remember how Pippin was right back in chapter three. Remember, you know, Sam and Frodo are taking the journey tolerably seriously. Right. And Frodo saying goodbye to the Shire as he passes through it. And Sam is in, uh, you know, wonder at seeing new parts of the Shire he's never seen before, even before he encounters the elves, right? And uh, he's aware that he's leaving home, possibly forever, as far as he knows. And then there's Pippin on the on a walking party, right? And he's going around, and he's having a good time, and he's making jokes, and he seems to be taking it all quite lightly. So that seems, on the one hand, to be what Frodo is responding to, right? Pippin kind of sobered up, as it was pretty clear that there were these super creepy... Uh, you know, black-robed guys sniffing the ground and hunting them as they went across the Shire. But, um, but still, his, you know, Frodo's main thing is, okay, people, this is really serious, right? We're not joking. Um, uh, and instead of you know them sobering up, they just are anticipating his revelation, right? You know, as he makes these sort of veiled references. Um, that's when they're sitting around, you know, talking to each other, right? It's coming out in a minute, right? Then Mary reveals that they already know, right? He breaks in. This is the final slide we did last time saying, you know, I can tell you some of it myself. Some of that, you know, what you what you don't know how to start saying, let me help you, right? Um, now, remember what Mary reveals that he knows. He reveals that he knows that Frodo's leaving, right? That Frodo intends to leave the Shire. Right. You you're trying to say goodbye. Right. Danger has come upon you sooner than you expected and you have to leave and you don't want to. We're very sorry for you. Remember, that's 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 what he says. Um, uh, remember, his emphasis is you're trying to say goodbye. You have to go and you don't uh, uh, and you don't want to. Right. Frodo is shocked. Pippin's comment following that up, you know, Pippin says, um, he basically reveals all the tells, right? What were the things that, by which Frodo gave away, you know, what he was doing? You know, that Frodo gave away the fact that he was actually, how did they figure it out, right? And Pippin says, Pippin says, look, you've obviously been going around and saying goodbye to all of your old haunts, right? We could tell that you're leaving because you've been, you know, saying goodbye to all these different parts of the Shire. And there were all those talks with Gandalf, Right. And all the elaborate things that you did to try to make it look like, you know, you're pretending you run out of money and selling your hold to the Sackville Baggins is, right? So what Pippin seems to suggest here is it was obvious that something was up, right? And it's obvious that you're leaving. So we put it together, right? We put it together that you're actually going to be leaving the Shire and going off on an adventure, right? Um... The question is, where does this leave us exactly? If we think about sort of where both of them are, that is Frodo on the one hand and the conspirators on the other hand, right? Where are we at this point? In particular, what does Frodo think they're thinking, right? Um, my suspicion is that 
Frodo believes that they think he's going off on an adventure like Bilbo. That seems the logical conclusion based on what Pippin just told him, right? We can tell you're leaving, and you've been having all those close talks with Gandalf, and then acting super suspiciously, right? Pretending you ran out of your money and selling Bag End. Clearly, there is something up. You've got a plan with Gandalf, right? You're leaving the Shire. And what is unstated is just like Bilbo, right? Less suddenly than Bilbo, right? You're not just vanishing like Bilbo vanished. But clearly, it has something to do with the conversations you've had with Gandalf and you're planning to head out, right? Um, so that's where we pick up. And uh, let's look at Frodo's response to that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um Right, Nick, exactly. Well, the thing is, Nick, he Frodo has no reason to know yet that they have any reason even to suspect the nature of the, of the thing, right? So this is, I think, one of the things that's really interesting about how this unfolds, based on what Mary said and based on what Pippin just said. He has no reason to suspect that they know any more than that he's leaving, right? So it's a shock to him to discover that they know he's leaving the Shire, right? But he thinks that that's all that he, he, he thinks that that's all that they know. Right. And so he's still sitting there thinking like, wow, okay. I didn't realize they knew that, but oh man, they have no idea. Right. They can't possibly know the real nature of the situation. Um, and I think it's important to remember that when we look at how the conversation then continues. Good heavens, said Frodo. I thought I had been both careful and clever. I don't know what Gandalf would say. Remember, Pippin had just said, you've not been nearly careful or clever enough for that, right? Did you really think you'd thrown dust in all our eyes? Um, I thought I had been both careful and clever. I don't know what Gandalf would say. Is all the Shire discussing my departure then? Oh no, said Mary. Don't worry about it. Uh, don't worry about that. The secret won't keep for long, of course, but at present it is, I think, only known to us conspirators. After all, you must remember that we know you well and are often with you. We can usually guess what you were thinking. I knew Bilbo, too. To tell you the truth, I have been watching you rather closely ever since he left. I thought you would go after him sooner or later. Indeed, I expected you to go sooner, and lately we have been very anxious. We have been terrified that you might give us the slip and go off suddenly all on your own like he did. Ever since this spring, we have kept our eyes open and done a good deal of planning on our own account. You are not going to escape so easily. Now, before we look at Frodo's response... Again, think from Frodo's point of view and interpret what you're hearing, right? Notice his first concern. I thought I had been really careful and clever, right? I, I, I'd, I had had this cunning plan to leave so that nobody would suspect I was leaving. And now I find that you guys are telling me it was obvious, right? Great, he says. Um, is all the Shire discussing my departure then? It might at first sound like he's saying, dude, did you guys tell everybody, right? But I don't think he's accusing them of blabbing. I think he's saying, like, I thought I'd been really clever. Does this mean that everybody, th you know, has it been obvious to everybody just like it was obvious to you, right? Um, and Mary says, no, 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 don't worry about that. Notice Mary's responding directly to that. Right. You must remember that we know you well and are often with you. It's obvious to us. Right. But it's not obvious to anybody else. And no, 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 don't worry. We are the only people who know that you're leaving the Shire. Everybody else has been has been taken in. Um, and uh, but now look where Mary goes in the second half of that paragraph. Right. Not only have we picked up on the fact that you're leaving. Right. We always expected you to leave, right? Um, to tell you the truth, I've been watching you closely ever since he left. I thought you would go after him sooner or later. Notice how that would seem to confirm the conclusion that I was suggesting before, right? That Frodo, if Frodo is thinking, oh, okay, so they figured out that I'm going on an, uh, I'm leaving the Shire, they probably think I'm going on another one of Gandalf's patented Hobbit adventures right? Like he's often sending the Tooks on, and, and, and as everybody knows, everybody in this group anyway knows, sent Bilbo off on, right? They probably think that Gandalf is coming, he's sending me on an adventure now, right? To follow in Bilbo's footsteps. And Mary seems to confirm that. Right? I, 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 I've been waiting for you to go off on your own adventure, right? I thought you would go after him sooner or later. 
either to pursue him and try to find Bilbo or just to go after him in the more general sense of like to go off like he did right on an adventure. And now it's finally and now it's finally happening. Right. Um, so. Is, so I get, that seems to be what's going on. So with that frame of mind and then, of course, you'll notice where Mary goes at the end. You're not going to escape so easily. Right. So he naturally concludes that they're going to not let him go, right? But I must go, said Frodo. It cannot be helped, dear friends. It is wretched for us all, but it's no use your trying to keep me. Since you have guessed so much, please help me and do not hinder me. So, okay, so notice they're still not talking at all. He hasn't said anything about what the real purpose of the journey is, right? They didn't ask. And so maybe Frodo thinks like, okay, I guess like make the best of a bad situation. They figured out that I'm leaving, but, but at least they don't know why. Right. Um, at least that secret is still safe. So, okay. Um, but, but I do have to go, right? Let's not, you do not understand, said Pippin. You must go. And therefore we must too. Mary and I are coming with you. Sam is an excellent fellow and would jump down a dragon's throat to save you if he did not trip over his own feet, but you will need more than one companion on your dangerous adventure. Now, what's Frodo's response going to be to this? I don't mean what does he actually say, right? But again, interpret this. Try to put yourself into Frodo's perspective because I think it's really neat the way that this unfolds in front of Frodo. If we don't, if we can distance ourselves from it, um, that is, we know the the extent of the conspiracy because we've read this before, right? Trying to forget that, though, and seeing how information is being revealed to Frodo and therefore, like, how what he's doing with that information, right? Um, and so here's Pippin saying, no, 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 we're not going to try to stop you. We're coming with you, right? Mary and I are coming. You must go and therefore we must go too. How is Frodo going to interpret that? remember something that we just saw at the beginning of the chapter, right? When Mary says to them after meeting them at the ferry, um, you seem to have been having adventures, which is not quite fair without me. Uh, adventures are fun, right? Adventures are like sport. Uh, they have... You know, and I've said before, I said last week, I think, uh, that that line about, you know, having adventures without me, with, you know, which is not quite fair without me, is a, 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 a huge indicator of the shift in this little subculture of Hobbit society, right? That is the, the one under the influence of Bilbo. How different from the way that Bilbo's friends and neighbors viewed adventures uh, in The Hobbit. But Frodo knows this too, right? So what is he going to be concluding in response to this, Right. They think this is one of those fun adventures, right? They want to come along, even though Pippin says your dangerous adventure, right? He started off, remember, Frodo started off emphasizing the danger. Well, of course, Bilbo's adventure was a dangerous adventure, too. Um, but they get that. They accept that, right? So that it's not that they think that, you know, adventures are all fun and games. Uh, they know from Bilbo's stories that there's plenty of danger to go around uh, uh, on adventures. But... Um, they also clearly have a very positive view of adventures and think they're fun and feel deprived if they miss out, right? Um, so, it, again, it sort of seems that this is what is um, what's going on exactly. Uh, Lincoln Frodo thinks that uh, Mary and the others believe he's going on a there and back again adventure. Um, that seems to be that seems to be the case. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, Marielle, that's a really great point, and I agree. Please do bring this up again later on. The contrast between uh, the sort of general hobbit, the, the the attitude of the hobbits in the room to the adventure uh, contrasted with the attitude of the dwarves uh, in the room to the adventure when they take Bilbo off on an adventure, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good, good. Um Irinda says, it makes me wonder how often the word adventure is tossed around among these friends in the past. A lot, it sounds like. I mean, again, Mary's, Mary's words are to me very revealing, right, about how they think and how they talk about this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. 
Frodo's response to that. My dear and most beloved hobbits, said Frodo, deeply moved. But I could not allow it. I decided that long ago, too. You speak of danger, but you do not understand. This is no treasure hunt, no there and back journey. I am flying from deadly peril into deadly peril. Right, so now here is, so Frodo's response is not like, oh, great, right? He doesn't roll his eyes. He's moved, right? They want to come with him. This is a big deal. And I think this is really, this is really neat uh, in Frodo because on the one hand, it's easy. Irindus, right? It's easy to talk about adventure a lot. It's easy to throw that word around, um, to use that word to characterize the kind of thing that might happen to you between Hobbiton and Buckland, right? Like Mary was doing. Um, it's quite another thing to actually say we are willing to leave our homes, you know, and go off into the wild uh, on an adventure. Like when you're actually confronted with it, uh, leaving everything you have behind. Sam has already been confronted with that, and we've seen him kind of dealing with that. In part, that's what that conversation the morning after the elves was about with Frodo, right? When Frodo says, do you still want to, now that you've seen elves, do you still want to come? Right? Are you? This is a big deal. Are you really serious about it? Um, the fact that they are really serious about coming, Frodo finds really moving. Like I have to go on this adventure now. Of course, here he's moved for reasons that he thinks they don't understand. Right? Because he knows he's not on a there and back again adventure. Um, he knows that he is going off into permanent exile. He had been thinking, I'm going to have to leave the Shire and leave it behind. I'm going to have to send myself into exile so that I can protect the Shire and draw the danger after me away from the rest of the Shire. So I am deliberately turning my back on everything that I care about and everything that I value. That's like I'm selling Bag End and I'm leaving my friends forever and I'm going off into self-sacrificial exile. So... He knows that's what's involved. So to him, that idea, right, that kind of concept of them following him and coming off on his journey with him is deeply moving, right? You would you would do that for me? Um, it doesn't seem that he's... Again, he thinks he knows much more than they do, right? Um, I think that his... Uh, beneath his my dear and most beloved hobbits statement is... Um, a, like, I know you don't really understand what this means, but it's still really moving, right? Um, I am deeply moved at the idea of your, com- of your being willing to come with me, but I know that you don't really understand, right? You're not really, you wouldn't really be making that decision uh, fully cognizant of its meaning, right? Um, uh I decided that long ago, too. I could not allow it, right? I've made up my mind that I... like You don't understand that I have to go alone. That's part of the point. You speak of danger, but you don't understand. Um, this isn't like Bilbo. I'm not just following in Bilbo's footsteps, right? You're not... You don't realize what kind of book you're in, my friends, right? Is what he's what he says to them here. Um, and, uh, yes, uh, Tony, you can mention the class differences between Sam and the others implicit in the teasing that they give Sam about his loyalty. Yes. What about his tripping and everything? Yes. His tripping over his own feet. Um, yes, Sam is an excellent fellow, but, uh, uh, but you're going to need more than one companion on your dangerous adventure. Um, Exactly, Oakwig. Uh, Frodo has decided to go with just... He's, he's going to go alone with his servant. Right. Um, exactly. Exactly. Um, and yes, Marielle, I do think that the age difference plays a role here. Um, as Marielle says, Frodo is a confirmed bachelor well into middle age. These are young hobbits with life and possible families in front of them. And Marielle, I would add, inheritances. Right? I mean, the, 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 the two of them are going to be very, you know, are going to grow to be very important hobbits, right? So th- they have more to leave behind, really, even than Frodo does. Um, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, Lincoln is quibbling about well into middle age. Not well into middle age. I mean, no, 50 is not the equivalent of, like, you know, into the 40s or early 50s for a uh, for a human. Um, but still, it's it is a it is a it is a mature age, right? And his friends are significantly younger uh, than he is. Um, so yes, Emma Thorne, that seems right to me. Um, Frodo at 50, uh, and his young friends just under still the uh, uh, the age of maturity. He's like somebody in his. He's like a human in his mid thirties, maybe who's traveling with like 18 to 21 year olds, basically. That's the, the kind of gap between Frodo and the other three hobbits, all of the other three hobbits. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. Um, okay. So let's keep going. Now Mary drops the bomb. Of course we understand, said Mary firmly. That is why we have decided to come. We know the ring is no laughing matter, but we are doing our we are uh, going to do our best to help you against the enemy. The ring, said Frodo, now completely amazed. Yes, the ring, said Mary. My dear old hobbit, you don't allow for the inquisitiveness of friends. I have known about the existence of the ring for years, before Bilbo went away, in fact. But since he obviously regarded it as a secret, I kept the knowledge in my head, until we formed our conspiracy. I did not know Bilbo, of course, as well as I know you. I was too young, and he was also more careful, but he was not careful enough. If you want to know how I first found out, I will tell you. Go on said Frodo faintly. Okay. Um, uh, you guys are still talking about Hobbit ages. Um, yes, Pippin is very young. Pippin would be the equivalent of like a 16 or 17 year old, basically. Um, you know, probably, yeah, 16, 17, basically. Um, he's very young. An exit. Okay. This is the moment where, well, still not quite, right? Because all Mary has revealed here is that they know about the ring and they're going to help him against the enemy. Um, So we know you have the ring. We know that the necromancer is after you and we want to help you with that. We are volunteering to come with you Not because we don't understand that, but because we do understand that. Because we do understand the significance of this. He was deeply moved just at thinking, just in imagining them volunteering ignorantly, right? Um, He um, he is would be much more deeply moved knowing this, but of course he's too amazed to be quite so deeply moved again. Um, But. Okay, so Mary has revealed they know about the ring. And then he goes on to talk about Bilbo. He's known about the ring for years, right? But he's already given away an important thing. They know, Mary and Pippin and Fatty, know what Gandalf told Frodo. Because Frodo only just discovered in chapter 2, that the ring was at all connected with the enemy. Mary cannot possibly have known that for years. Mary knew about the existence of the ring, but he's already dropped the fact that he knows what Gandalf told them, told Frodo, right? Um, so he drops that. But he then goes on just to emphasize the fact that he's known about the ring for a long time. So I know that Bilbo had a magic ring. I know he gave the magic ring to you. Right? Um, He knew about it before Bilbo went away. So Frodo wants to hear, how did he know this? It was the Sackville Bagginses that were his downfall, as you might expect. One day, a year before the party, I happened to be walking along the road when I saw Bilbo ahead. Suddenly in the distance, the SBs appeared, coming toward us. Bilbo slowed down, and then, hey presto, he vanished. 
I was so startled that I hardly had the wits to hide myself in a more ordinary fashion, but I got through the hedge and walked along the field inside. I was peeping through into the road, after the SBs had passed, and was looking straight at Bilbo when he suddenly reappeared. I caught a glint of gold as he put something back in his trouser pocket. After that, I kept my eyes open. In fact, I confess I spied. But you must admit that it was very intriguing, and I was only in my teens. I must be the only one in the Shire, besides you, Frodo, that has ever seen the old fellow's secret book. You have read his book? cried Frodo. Good heavens above, is nothing safe? Not too safe, I should say, said Mary. But I have only had one rapid glance, and that was difficult to get. He never left the book about. I wonder what became of it. I should like another look. Have you got it, Frodo? No, it was not at Bag End. He must have taken it away. Um. <laughs> Mariel says, can I uh, say that I love the, that the natural reaction for seeing the SBs uh, appear is hiding? Yes, uh, everybody hides, right, when they come along. Um, you don't want to, you, you don't want to confront them. Um, couple things that I notice here. First of all, notice how far we are staying away from the big topic of the enemy, right? And how he knew that the ring had anything to do with the enemy. Um, instead, we get into telling stories, right? Stories of Bilbo and the Sackville Bagginses and Mary's confession that he was spying on Bilbo and even sneaked in and caught a glimpse of, uh, of the Red Book at one point, right? Um, uh, I wonder what became of it. I should like another look. Uh, these are old stories, right? Um, and think about this from Mary's point of view. Mary invites you to do that, right? Um, but you must admit that it was very intriguing, and I was only in my teens, right? So put yourself into Mary's position. Mary is young, very young, right? Mary is like a middle schooler. And he sees Bilbo. Now, who was Bilbo to Mary? Bilbo would already have been a legendary figure, right? The great Bilbo Baggins who vanished and came back with chests of gold and, uh, you know, this, this now totally transformed and countercultural hobbit um, who has been telling them, you know, who tells them stories and everything. And he sees him, you know, when he's only in his teens, he sees... Um, he sees Bilbo doing something actually magical. I mean, think about what that must have been. It's like got to be this close to Sam seeing elves for the first time, right? I mean, here's young Mary seeing the legend of Bilbo, like, confirmed in front of his eyes. Like, oh my gosh, he is magical. He can vanish, right? Wow, that's incredible. Um, and... And so then he like sp spies to try to figure out more to like to sort of see like what what else can he do? What's the so he tries to find out his secrets, right? Which he must keep hidden in that book that he keeps uh, uh, concealed so well, right? That he got a glimpse of, but he was never able to find again. Um, so again, thinking about this in the cultural context, and think about how this would seem to connect uh, with. The context of this conversation, right? One of the things that Mary is saying is not just, here's how I found out. That is what he's saying, right? But one of the other things that kind of comes along with that is, let me explain to you why I feel the way that I feel about this, right? Why is it that we are committed to coming with you? Um, and part of that it would seem to be based on this long digression to talk about the legend of Bilbo, right? Uh, and Mary's discovery of the legend of Bilbo is what it means to him to be a part of this, right? No, I am willing to give things up to go on. And because again, it's like Sam and the elves, right? Um, this is, uh, this is something that has meant a lot to me. Uh, exactly. Irindus, not only is Bilbo magical, but magic is real. Yes, exactly. The hey presto thing, right? Hey presto, he vanished. I was looking right at him and he appeared again, right? Absolutely. It's a really huge deal. Um, uh, yes, Nick, Bilbo did invoke wonder in him. That's definitely Mary's moment, right? Of, uh, uh, when wonder was invoked. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so this is a re so to some extent, Mary seems to be sort of setting up to basically say, 
we've already emphasized that we're your friends, right? That we know you really well and that we care about you and that we've been worried that you were going to leave, right? We didn't want you to go off unsupervised, right? So we st- they start with their friendship. Then we get this revelation of kind of worldview and background, right? This is like what I've always wanted, what I've always wanted to learn more about. Um, I knew that this stuff was real, right? I believe the old tales, whatever Ted Sandyman may say, uh, as Sam said, right? And so here's Mary affirming the same thing, right? We want to be a part of this. Um, uh, Then he keeps going. Well, as I was saying, Mary proceeded, I kept my knowledge to my my knowledge to myself till this spring when things got serious. Then we formed our conspiracy, and as we were serious too and meant business, we have not been too scrupulous. Okay, so they formed their conspiracy. Again, think about how that must have gone, right? So okay, so Frodo and where must it have started? Had to have started with Frodo or sorry, with Mary and Pippin and Fatty Bulger and Fosco Boffin. Right. The four of them. Not Sam. Sam cannot have been part of this conspiracy. He's not their peer. He doesn't hang out with them. Right. We see who Sam hangs out with. Right. He heads out, hangs out with Ted Sandyman and other hobbits of his class down at the Green Dragon. Right. Um, uh, he doesn't he doesn't he knows Mary and Pippin because they've been in and out of Bag End a lot over the last 17 years. Um, but they're not friends with him. Right. Um, so. Mary has now Rapscallion, excellent name. Uh, Rapscallion says if Mary and Frodo were that close, one would think Mary would inquire about the magical disappearances to Frodo. Right. Why didn't Mary ever bring up the ring to Frodo? Um, it's a great question. I don't really know the answer to that. Um, my guess would be, I mean, what it seems to kind of hint to me is that this was private to Mary. Um, I kept my knowledge to myself, he said. Um, that, remember Sam in the Green Dragon, right? When he talks about the elves sailing away, right? Sailing, sailing. And Ted Sandyman says, but I warrant you haven't seen them doing it. And Sam says, I don't know, but he won't say any more, right? Because he thinks he did see an elf once. But you'll notice he won't talk about it. He doesn't want it to come under discussion at the Green Dragon. He doesn't want there to be a big debate and people to make fun of him for believing that else. It's too private. It's too important, right, to be brought out and debated the pros and cons, right? Um, he thinks that he saw an elf, but it's, but he keeps it to himself. Mary seems to do the same thing with his glimpse of Bilbo's magic, Right and his knowledge that Bilbo had a magic ring, um, he's not told that apparently to Pippin or anybody else, any of their friends, and he never talked to Frodo. Tungo, I think you're right. Mary is being a good friend, keeping it to himself, that because he, he's not spreading it around. Um, that doesn't explain, of course, why he wouldn't talk to Frodo about it. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, he's it's you know Bilbo obviously regarded it as a secret, right? As he says, so you know he's uh, doing right by them by not spreading it around. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Tony as Tony says uh, again, it's it's like a Bigfoot or a UFO sighting. Yeah, it, that's it. Certainly informs Sam's not mentioning it, right? I mean, imagine how Ted Sandyman would light into him, right? If he came out with, oh, "No, I saw an elf once." Uh, think of the scorn uh, that Ted Sandyman would heap upon him uh, under a uh, in in a situation like that. Um, so anyway. For one reason or another, maybe Lady Shmebuak, maybe it is that he th- thought that Frodo would be angry, you know, that, uh, you know, he was, um, uh, you know, that he knew family secrets and that kind of thing. That's possible. You know, it's all, that's always possible, too. Um, but again, for whatever reason, what the reason was Mary didn't tell anybody. And then they formed their conspiracy. Why did they form their conspiracy and why did Mary share this information, right? Um, they formed their conspiracy this spring. What happened in the spring? Gandalf came to visit again. Remember, Gandalf hasn't been in town for nine years. 
nine years. Think how old they were the last time Gandalf was around. They've heard stories about Gandalf all their lives, right? Um, but they were, you know, Pippin was what? The age that Merry was when Merry saw uh, Bilbo vanish, maybe? The last time Gandalf was in town? So Gandalf showing up again after nine years is a major event. And things got serious at that point, right? Um, and they formed their conspiracy. Um, which means at that point, Mary told them. Because it's obviously, it becomes relevant at that point, right? Um, it becomes relevant that he could vanish, right? So, okay, so Gandalf comes back and all of them are thinking... Right. This probably starts with a conversation between Mary and Pippin and maybe Fatty and Fosco as well, saying he's going to go. Right. Gandalf came back. Gandalf's going to send him on an adventure just like he did Bilbo. And then Mary coming out with. Wait, it's worse than that. Right. Uh, I have reason to think he could just literally vanish uh, and disappear. Um, so that's. um. Uh, that's a big deal, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's a game changer. So he, sh so he shares that, right? Um, and they have not been too scrupulous. Uh, you were not a very easy nut to crack and Gandalf is worse. But if you want to be introduced to our chief investigator, I can produce him. Where is he? Said Frodo, looking around as if he expected a masked and sinister figure to come out of a cupboard. Step forward, Sam, said Mary, and Sam stood up with a face scarlet up to the ears. Here's our collector of information, and he collected a lot, I can tell you, before he was finally caught, after which, I may say, he seemed to regard himself as on parole and dried up. Sam, cried Frodo, feeling that amazement could go no further, and quite unable to decide whether he felt angry, amused, relieved, or merely foolish. Yes, sir, said Sam. "'Begging your pardon, sir, but I meant no wrong to you, Mr. Frodo, nor to Mr. Gandalf, for that matter. He has some sense, mind you, and when you said go alone, he said, no, take someone as you can trust.' Um. <laughs> yeah, Lincoln says that he loves the line, as if he expected some masked and sinister figure to appear out of a cupboard. Uh, yeah, that is a, that is a, really, a really great line, right? Um, so again... What's Frodo thinking at this point, right? Um, uh, if you want to be introduced to our chief investigator, I can produce him. He's just said, okay, so we've we formed a conspiracy. We've not been scrupulous, right? Uh, uh, you know, we were serious too and meant business and we've not been too scrupulous. We had a chief investigator, right? So it does sound like they hired a professional, right? They got a professional, a professional burglar uh, uh, to come in and spy on them. Right. Um, yeah, Nick, exactly. Frodo's like has gone from, uh, you know, I know so much more than you and I don't know how to break it to you to, OK, wow, that's great. But you guys um, don't really understand the significance of this, but I'm deeply moved. Right. To, OK, now I'm kind of creeped out. Right. You guys are hiring like a P.I. to, to trail me or something. Uh, you know, what's up with that? Um uh, what happened? If we think it through, we can reconstruct exactly what happened. How long is Sam on the job? Do you think? You think about it? Think it through. When did things get serious? In the spring. It has to have been when Gandalf arrived, right? I mean, everything was going along perfectly normally until then. Gandalf coming was totally unexpected to Frodo, and his news was completely out of the blue to Frodo. So there can't have been any other reason for things to get serious prior to Gandalf's arrival, apart from the fact that that's exactly what made sense uh, to be the, the red flag. Right? I mean, Gandalf is coming, adventures are happening, oh my gosh, he's going to go away. Right? Gandalf arrives in the evening of one day, 
They have a little conversation before they go to bed. Gandalf stops telling him anything important, and then they come back and, and tell him the next day, the day on which Sam is caught listening outside the window, right? Um, so, yeah, I agree, Lincoln and Tony. He has to have been on the job for one day. They, the conspirators, the conspiracy has to have happened that day, like immediately when Gandalf arrived. So somebody, they were around, right? Clearly, they were around the Hobbiton area, Merry and Pippin. And uh, they knew when Gandalf arrived. And that same evening, got together and were like, okay, Gandalf is here. Frodo's going to go, you know, Frodo's going to get sent, right? What do we do? And Merry's like, oh my gosh, she's got a magic ring. I never told you this, but Frodo probably has a magic ring, right? What do we do? So what do they do? They recruit Sam. Sam is the obvious spy, right? Clearly, they think, we've got to get in there and figure out what Frodo is, what, what Gandalf is telling him, right? It is imperative for us to find a way to overhear Gandalf and Frodo's conversation. How can we best do that? Sam, right? So they go and recruit Sam. I think we have textual evidence to know that they recruited Sam. Um, and this goes back, I didn't... Um, I didn't make a separate slide of this, but uh, we can, uh, uh, I can find it, I think, well enough. Um, so going back to the Green Dragon conversation, right, with uh, Sam and Ted Sandiman at the beginning. Um, uh, at the beginning of uh, chapter two. After their conversation, uh, so Ted Sandiman has just uh, said, you know, well, friends, I'm off for home. Your good elf and drains his mug and went out noisily. Sam sat silent and said no more. He had a good deal to think about. Now, he's probably still thinking about elves and sailing and all that kind of thing, right? For one thing, there was a lot to do up in the Bag End Garden, and he would have a busy day tomorrow if the weather cleared. The grass was growing fast, but Sam had more on his mind than gardening. After a while, he sighed and got up and went out, right? Sam had more on his mind than gardening. Yeah, yeah, he does. He probably has that conversation that he must have had earlier that same evening with Mary and Pippin, right? When they said, Sam, we're worried that Frodo's going to sneak off and be sent off and we, we, we want to help. Surely you would want to help Mr. Frodo, wouldn't you, Sam? Right? Well, then, okay. So find a way to overhear the conversation and... Sam is thinking about all the gardening he's got to do tomorrow. The grass was growing fast. I probably could get my shears and pretend to get... I think he's planning how he's going to spy on Mr. Frodo in that moment, when he's thinking about gardening, right? As he's thinking about more than gardening, right? Um, <laughs> Tarlonio and Tony Mead are suggesting that... Um, um, Sam should have never learned to read, right? Uh, trouble, troubles come of it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, S.R. Perry says, poor gaffer, Sam has been caught up in the business of his betters. Yeah, absolutely, right? Not only Frodo's, but Merry and Pippin's, right? I mean, here, there, look at, look at Merry and Pippin, his betters, corrupting the youth, right? Coming by and, and uh, 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 recruiting Sam to be their chief investigator, right? Go spy on your master and report back to us. I mean, come on. Right? Re spy on your master and report back to us what he says in his parlor? That's a serious no-no for a servant. I mean, that's a betray, to betray family secrets? You don't do that. Right? Now, you know, good, um, good motivations, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so it's, you know, it's, I, I, I read you the whole passage there, right? So it's not more explicit than that. It doesn't actually say that he's thinking about the conspiracy. But I think in, in, in context, and especially looking back from this passage here, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that that's what the more than gardening is that's on um, Sam's mind, especially since we know it's not just that we know that he is their chief investigator and, you know, has been recruited to be their chief investigator. But it has to have been now. Like, this evening is the only time he could possibly have been recruited. Because Gandalf has just arrived, and the conversation is going to happen the next day. And here's another thing. 
And here's another thing. Um, Sam. Let's go back to um, when Sam is infenestrated, right? Um, what gives Sam away? You know, it's been a while since they heard the sound of his shears. But um, but let's uh, let's go forward and look at this here. Um, in the uh, in the elves, sir, speech, right? Uh, he says, um, Gandalf is asking, what have you heard and why did you listen? Right? Um, and Gandalf's eyes are flashing and his brows are sticking out like bristles because he's thinking like, this is a spy. Right? Remember, that was the transition that Gandalf used when he went over to the window. Um, you know, he says, uh, uh, you know, that the enemy has many spies and many ways of knowing, and then he pulls Sam Gamgee in through the window, right? So he suspects Sam initially of spying on them, which he is spying on them on purpose, right? Sam says, I heard a deal I didn't rightly understand about an enemy and rings and Mr. Bilbo, sir, and dragons and a fiery mountain and, and elves, sir. I listened because I couldn't help myself, if you know what I mean. Lord bless me, sir, but I do love tales of that sort. Now, that's all true. Perfectly true, right? But it's not the whole story. Sam is prevaricating here. He didn't just wander under the window with his shears in the course of the, you know, honest pursuit of his gardening business, right? Trimming the hedge or in trimming the grass rather and happening to overhear and he does love tales of that sort and couldn't help himself right baloney he was there on purpose he was scheming the night before i'll bring my shears to cut the grass because that'll get me right under the parlor window and that's probably where they'll be sitting right that was done with malice of forethought right so no way so he's he's trying to pass it off right oh yeah no i just i i listen because i because I couldn't couldn't help myself, right? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Gandalf then says, "So you heard that Mister Frodo is going away?" And Sam says, "I did, sir, and that's why I choked, which you heard seemingly. I tried not to, sir, but it burst out of me. I was so upset." Makes me wonder, is that true? It literally never occurred to me until this reading to question that. Because it seems like just what Sam would do, right? I mean, think about Sam's, you know, touching devotion to Frodo and, and all that. You know, and he's, uh, uh, you can tell, it's, it's so easy to imagine him accidentally, you know, choking, right? Oh, you know exclaiming when he hears that Frodo is planning to go away. Because, you know, when it just bursts on him like that, right, the horror of that idea, except it didn't just burst on him, right? He was there under the window on purpose because he suspected that Frodo was going to be going away. That's the whole premise for why he was there. It didn't just suddenly burst over him that Frodo might leave. Now, it's possible, of course, that upon hearing the final confrontation, uh, or the final, rather, sorry, hearing the final confirmation, right, of Frodo's plans, right, that, that the wor their worst fears are, 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 are realized, right, and Frodo is, in fact, being sent off into the blue by Gandalf. It's quite possible that that's, um, that that, confirmation, the grim reality of that caused him to cry out accidentally, right? But frankly, I'm skeptical. I'm very skeptical about that. Um, so think about it this way. Is, uh, if he did it on purpose, if it wasn't spontaneous... If he made a noise at that point on purpose, why? Um, my reading of that 
would be that it would be a kind of confession, right? He, on the one hand, uh, in fact, it seems to me maybe something like a compromise with his own conscience. Mary and Pippin, whom he knows to be Mr. Frodo's close friends, come to him and say, we want you to spy on your master. I can only imagine when somebody comes to Sam and says, we want you to eavesdrop on your master and report back to us, that he would say, heck no, you know, Gamgees don't play that way. I am not going to spy on my master for anybody, right? And then they're like, oh, but we're really concerned. We think he's going to leave. We just want to help him. And he agrees to do it. Clearly, he agrees to do it, right? But I can't imagine he would still be comfortable with that, fully comfortable with that. But he believes in their good intentions, right? And the fact that they want to help Mr. Frodo. And notice his words here. He has some sense, mind you, meaning Mr. Frodo doesn't have any sense when it comes to this kind of thing, right? Mr. Frodo is perfectly, because Mr. Frodo is very brave, right? He's very likely to just go off on this adventure by himself, which would be foolish, right? So I can see what Mr. Merry and Mr. Pippin are worried about, right? So, okay, I'll help them, right, for the sake of helping Mr. Frodo, who doesn't have any sense when it comes to these matters, right? But by crying out at the end of the conversation, so now he's heard the whole thing, right? So he succeeded in his spying job, but he arranges to get himself caught at the end, right? Um his fear that Gandalf would turn him into something unnatural could very well be perfectly true, right? Um, But you'll notice what is the result of his being caught based upon his... uh, Well, notice he has... He's the one who makes the suggestion. Couldn't you take me to see elves, sir, when you go? Right? That was his idea in the first place. So he manages to get himself caught and then to volunteer for the journey and get assigned, right? So there's Gandalf saying, I've thought of something to punish you properly, right? To shut your mouth and to punish you properly for uh, uh, for listening. We talked about the punish you properly thing last time, right? Uh, You know, Lincoln, in your uh, really interesting comment on that last week, wouldn't it be lovely if that whole thing, if Gandalf's clever punishment, which is really a gift, turns out to be Sam getting exactly, like, basically Sam maneuvering uh, him into exactly what he wanted in the first place, right? Uh, You know, if this is Sam being like, checkmate, checkmate, right? Got it. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, it, it's Lincoln, it would be devious, right? But we have some good reason to think that he is devious. And I agree, I missed this before, but uh, Lincoln, I agree with you. Uh, the evidence suggests that Sam is very much better at thinking on his feet and at keeping secrets than Frodo is. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, you think how Frodo was performing just a, you know, a couple paragraphs before, right? Uh, Sam would have done very much better than that. And remember... Sam also positioned himself into it deceitfully, right? Or deceptively, let me at least say. Positioned himself into a place where he could overhear the the advice that Gildor gives to Frodo, right? Um, He was faking it. He wasn't asleep. Uh, We we can figure that out from the next morning, uh, as we talked about at the time, when Sam talks about the conversation that he had with the elves after Frodo was asleep. Um, He wouldn't have had it if he was true, well and truly sound asleep, right? He was faking it all along. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, cool. So, um, so yeah, I, 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 I'm not 100% sure of my theory about Sam's uh, sort of semi-confession and maneuvering into being assigned on the, to go on the trip, uh, but I like it. I like that reading. I think it works. Um and uh, and is sort of the final uh, kind of tour de force of the conspiracy, right? Um, on the one hand, it might seem absurd that the chief investigator, when Frodo is in, is imagining a masked and sinister figure, right, instead to be presented with Sam, 
right? I mean, what a come down from that, right? What a what, what an absurd juxtaposition to think about Sam as the cunning chief investigator. Uh, and it turns out, actually, yeah, uh huh, he was uh, he was that cunning. Although he played everybody, <laughs> in fact, in that instance, and managed to. What did he manage to do? He managed to be, well, if Bilbo managed to be an honest burglar in The Hobbit, Sam manages to be an honest spy, right? To uh, uh, to keep faith with both parties, which would have seemed impossible. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, Tarlone Hill says, it's almost like Sam is the real hero of the story. Um, yes, and Bruinier, you're right. Sam plays the dumb country country bumpkin just right. And as someone, I forget who it was, um, earlier on was talking about Sam actually um, sort of taking advantage of the sort of class assumptions that people make, I forget who was, oh yes, Torlonio is you. Is Sam playing on the class prejudices? Yes, I think he does. I think he does uh, play on those, uh, those kind of assumptions. Um, uh, so, anyway, so I love this reading of Sam. Of course, you know, this puts Sam, this makes Sam into the, you know, the, the idea of Sam being like the devious, honest puppet master behind the whole, the whole thing is, uh, is awesome. Right. But I um, uh, but I really am. Uh, uh, but I love it. I love it. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to choose to believe this, uh, even if you can't be proven. Absolutely. Um, OK. So he said, it takes someone as you can trust, Gandalf said, but it does not seem that I can trust anyone, said Frodo. Sam looked at him unhappily. It all depends on what you want, put in Mary. You can trust us to stick to you through thick and thin, to the bitter end, and you can trust us to keep any secret of yours closer than you keep it yourself. But you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone and go off without a word. We are your friends, Frodo. Anyway, there it is. We know most of what Gandalf has told you. We know a good deal about the ring. We are horribly afraid, but we are coming with you or following you like hounds. Okay, Um, one more... Second, uh, one more thing that I just realized I forgot. After which I may say he seemed to regard himself as on parole and dried up. Um, so he dried up as soon as um, he dried up as soon as he's discovered by Gandalf. No, no. He obviously could only have eavesdropped on that one single conversation, the one that he's caught at the end of. Right. Um, had he dried up immediately, Mary and Pippin would never have learned anything from him. And they obviously have learned something from him because they know about the connection between the ring and the enemy. So Sam clearly told them. Right. So the parole, the being on parole clearly starts with what he learns after that point. Right. He went and told them what he learned by eavesdropping, but regarded himself as on parole and wouldn't tell them anymore. So he doesn't tell them anything that they that he learns after uh, uh, Gandalf catches him and he becomes part of the plan, right? The plan to leave with Mr. Frodo. Um, so the rest of it, like the business about the sale of Bag End and where he's going and what direction he's going to do and the whole, the, the truth behind the Crick Hollow plan and stuff, that stuff Merry and Pippin have to figure out for themselves. Um, but he clearly, he clearly uh, is, uh, is, has told them all that stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, anyway, so back to this. I don't want to I don't want to underplay this because Link and I agree with you. Uh, uh, the great declaration of solidarity and support from 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 Mary. Uh, this is this is very significant. We are your friends, Frodo. Right. That's what this means. You can't trust us to let you face trouble alone and go off without a word. Right. We are in. We know what Gan- most of what Gandalf told you. Not all of it, but we know most of it. We know a good deal about the ring. So we know. We know what you're doing. We know what it means. We know you're going off and probably not coming back. We know you're going off into danger and drawing it after you. And we are appropriately afraid of that. But we're coming with you or we're going to follow you like hounds. Um, And then Sam adds, After all, sir, you did ought to take the elves' advice. Gilder said you should take them as was willing and you can't deny it. 
I don't deny it, said Frodo, looking at Sam, who was now grinning. That image of the grinning Sam, right? As, because this is the moment where Sam has finally revealed the fullness of his duplicity. Well, maybe not the fullness, right? It's revealed everything. But when he's made it clear, like, I planned this all along, right? I have been spying. I have been manipulating. I have been, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, ah, Simon will see. Simon is is, uh, is saying he's skeptical because of the way that uh, how poorly he handles himself in a tight spot with Faramir in Athelion. Or does he? We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but um, anyway, okay. Okay. Um, yes, I'll never believe you are sleeping again, whether you snore or not. I shall kick you hard to make sure. Lincoln's second favorite uh, line of the chapter. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. You are a set of deceitful scoundrels, he said, turning to the others. I give in, uh, but bless you, he laughed, getting up and waving his arms. I give in. I will take Gildor's advice. I cannot help feeling happy, happier than I have felt for a long time. I had dreaded this evening. Um, as finally they come to the same place, as Frodo realizes, oh, so actually they really do know everything, right? That I, I, there's nothing for me to tell them. They know and they're gonna, and they're gonna come with me, right? Um, as he absorbs the significance of their solidarity, we know Sam, he knows Sam has been willing to come with him. Now seeing that, you know, his other friends are equally committed uh, and generous and willing to give up everything that they're giving up in order to come along, um, this is really a huge deal, but really, I think that um, I think that the significance of it is really emphasized. Um, to try to appreciate Frodo's reaction in this moment, what this means to Frodo, when we go through the conspiracy as we just did, sort of seeing how things unfold and how these levels of understanding continue uh, to. Uh, to be revealed. I think that that's really, really fascinating. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> everyone's now teasing me for how long it's going to be before we get to the scene with Faramir and Athelion. It'll be a while. It'll, it'll be a while. Um, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Um, let's see. We're running low on time. Do we have time for the song? I don't think we do. Let's start with the poem next time. Um, that'll be a good transition into talking about their, disc their, their, their plan moving forward, right? Let's, let's, end, let's end. I had dreaded this evening. That's a good place to stop. So we'll stop here uh, for now, and we'll pick up with the poem next time. Next time will be next week. Um, we will... Uh, um, I will be around next week. Uh, I will be away the week after that, but I will be around next week. So we should be able to, we should, maybe, we'll be able to finish chapter five next week. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Now it is time for our field trip. Uh, and tonight I want to return uh, to uh, Evendim and continue our tour through the heart of old Arnor. Uh, and see the the ways that Lotro has rendered that um, in our field trips. I'm I'm wanting to be a little bit more systematic in some ways, kind of kind of go through because again I love the way that they've interpreted the world, not only the stories which I'm going through uh, in my Grifflet stream, uh, all of the you know the, the the major quest lines and the epic plot and stuff. So you can follow my my uh, my Grifflet stream for the story there. But here, thinking through the Lord of the Rings as systematically as we are, we'll touch on those parts that are connected uh, to the story. Um, you know, the direct adaptation of the Lord of the Rings places and stories. But I also, in between those, uh, I want to go through and look at the entire Lotro world as it is related, because I've not been able to really do that in any other, uh, uh, you know, stream that I'm doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm really interested to go through and, and look at how uh, this becomes uh, a really interesting reading and adaptation of... Uh, uh, of of the of the book of the story so all right so let's get ready to head out people are stretching good okay so tonight 
I want to return. You're wondering why I haven't come up on stage yet. It's because I'm not there. You're not there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, no, I'm, I'm stationed to bring you to. Oh, awesome. You know, Great. Station. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, right. So where we're going to head, we're going to go back to even dim where we left off. So we left off at the colossal statue of Elendil, right? Who was straddling, uh, stra- straddling the river, straddling the, uh, Baranduin, the Brandywine, uh, as it was, as it, right as it emerges from Lake even dim. So, so uh, the, the, yeah. the location is high King's crossing. Yeah. Um, if you, if you have a port to Tinnadir, you can, Go to Tinnadir and get a swift travel horse to Hike King's Crossing. Yeah. Or if you don't, you can get a horse from West Breed to Tinnadir and then get a horse to Hike King's Crossing. Or can, can you go straight to Tinnadir? From West Bree. From West Bree? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, which is the closest stable to the Moor Hall, so that's convenient. Great. Um, and, uh, you know, if there is a hunter in the group, uh, if, if that hunter wants to port people, that would be great. But um, um, anyway, that's the way to do it. Okay. Yeah. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna port straight there because I, I don't want to I don't want to lose all the time that we we're kind of increasingly wandering away from you know our primary uh, like you know from Mickle Delving, which has been where we've begun most of our field trips. Uh, and if I have to ride from Mickle Delving all the way up to uh, High King's Crossing, it's going to take like half of our field trip time. Um. Here, I might as well introduce myself to the stable master while I'm here. Okay. Thank you, Maven, for bringing me here. And you guys can hopefully, you guys will be able to join me soon. I'll just, uh, I'll stay put for a while until you guys have a chance to catch up with me here. Um, so you'll notice, notice where we are here. So this is the even dim side that I'm looking, right? You can see the lake through the passage there. And then coming down this way we can see where we were before as here you can see the wide baranduin down and around the corner looking at the map here again right down around the corner so we were we were down over here in uh, barandolf uh looking at some of the ruins and uh you know this uh this sort of town slash fortress slash whatever it was um, you know, customs house maybe that was built up here at the junction of these two rivers. Um, the other river, of course, uh, is uh, uh, is this one right that comes in south of Fornost. Um, so anyway, we'll get to uh, the North Downs here later on. Um, so that this is where we were, and then we came up around the corner to see the huge, enormous statue. Of Elendil here. All right, I got some people arriving here. So we are right under the king. There is his scepter that we can just see up there, and there's his broken sword in that hand. Um, so I think we can. Can we get to the top? Can we go up on Elendil's head? Do I have to? No, I have to do the. I have to do the quest yeah, first. Yeah. The quest, okay, yeah. that's all right. That's all right. We don't need to. We don't. We, we don't. We don't need to do that. Um, now I agree. Well, okay. I was going to say that I, I agree with, uh, no, I'll still say, I agree with the observation that was made last week that, uh, this seems to be a poor design. It's, it's one thing that I think on a couple of occasions they overlooked, uh, in designing this river in the game is that it's pretty clear that the Baranguin must have been used as a trade route by the Numenorians uh, to come up from the sea, you know, to, 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 to be able to sail, uh, their ships between even dim and, uh, uh, and, and the, and the ocean. And there are a couple places, this of course, being one of them right here where we're standing, where the, the, the clearance is not nearly enough, uh, for ships to really go through underneath. And if you look up or so rather out, uh, here to the West, um, towards even dim, which you can see the you can see the lakes. They have a, a narrow set of rapids here, connecting, uh, you know, right here at the mouth of the of the Baranguin as it as it emerges from the lake. So they've clearly designed this to be impassable. But of course, you also remember the Brandywine Bridge itself. Um, they have made impassable to ships, uh, and I, I I think that it's that seems to me unlikely. I would um, I would suggest that that's a uh, that that's an error. Um, uh, I don't know if they had an, a contrary plan there. 
Um, but uh, even the even the fact that even the towers that are along that go along the 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 river. M- remember when we were standing by the stock tower, and you look up to the north and east, and you can see the other towers. So it looks like the Numenorians had watchtowers right at regular places to, in order to keep an eye on the whole river side. Why would they? Uh, why would they want to do that? Right? Why would they need to watch over the river up and down its whole length if ships couldn't go on it? Right? If it was impassable to shipping, then not so much reason to guard it. Right? Exactly. You might guard the edge of it. You might guard the frontier. But if so, your towers would all be on one side of the river. Right? If they're on either side of the river, it's pretty clear that it's the river itself as a major uh, uh, trade route that they're that they're looking over. Um, not to mention the city and even the ship that's there under the water, right, that we saw the wreck uh, in the river uh, suggests that, of course, they are intended to. So the clearance is, uh, is sort of an issue. Now, I, I, am, willing to, uh, I am willing to imagine that uh, the river might have changed, right? These rapids could be explained as something that has grown up over the last, you know, last few centuries. Um, that's entirely possible. The idea that the, the Numenorians would have had the technology to, you know, to dredge the river in that place and really to, um, uh, to, 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 to clear it out and keep a, a channel clear for shipping. But again, in that case, they would not have uh, covered it over with this stone bridge uh, in this, uh, in this, in this particular way. Um, looking at the tiles here. Notice we, trees and stars. Trees and stars. Star of Numenor and the tree, uh, uh, the white tree, right, um, which is down in Gondor. Uh, showing, of course, this is the... There we go. That's a good angle. Um, showing, of course, this is, this, is, this is the seat of the High King. Uh, remember that um, Elendil is not just king in the north, right? But lays claim to Gondor as well, to the entire unified kingdom. And, uh, you know, Isildur and then uh, uh, Meneldil, right, who is uh, then left after him uh, in the south uh, to be king after the after the final battle, uh, the son of Anarion. Um, they're only, you know, they're kings in Gondor under the high kingship uh, of the king in the north. That was the original plan when Isildur left uh, to come back up to the north and take up his father's crown. And you can see that their, their, uh, um, uh, their stonework suggests that, right? And we'll see these, you can see these in other places. We were in the Griffith stream. I was just looking at uh, the, pave, the paving in the road uh, down in Enidwyth, so south of Tharbad, um, as you get down closer to the Gap of Rohan, um, where the, the Greenway goes down to the south, and we see the same thing, the alternating stars and trees uh, down there. Um, uh, we, the, a question, was the Brandywine Bridge present at the time of Arnor? We talked about that a little bit in one stream, and I said I wasn't sure that bridge, as it's constructed in the game, looks to me like a hobbit bridge. Um, uh, but uh, but no, I was forgetting, that, and I forget Lincoln, maybe it was, or, or uh, uh, so I forget who it was. Somebody brought to my attention by email, I think, or maybe on Twitter, I can't remember. Uh, it was weeks ago now. I barely can remember that far back in my life. Um, but anyway, somebody reminded me of the fact that there is a reference to it. I had forgotten it, but it's there in the prologue um, when talking about the history of the Shire. When Marco and Blanco originally cross into the Shire, they cross the Bridge of Stone Bows. There is a stone bridge over the Brandywine that they use to cross over when they first settle the Shire. Um, but even the name of it, Stone Bows, suggests that it's it's an arching bridge, presumably under which uh, um, ships could travel. Um, yeah, good. Um, cool. Um, and now, JJ, I agree that doesn't necessarily mean it's the same bridge that's there now. Right. I mean, maybe we can imagine that it's been rebuilt by hobbits, you know, in the past thousand years sometime. Uh, entirely, entirely possible. Um uh, yeah, uh, no, uh, uh, Dragon Slayer Elf, I think that's a really good question. Um, the question is, how would the king of the United North and South Kingdoms rule such a large expanse of land, and where did Gondor and Arnor connect, if at all? Um, you're entirely correct. Without 
mass communication devices, right? With no railways, with no telegraphs or, or anything like that, much less no internet, right? Um, it's really challenging to be able to get to, to, to I mean, it takes a long, long time uh, for even news of what's happening in the far distant parts of the realm to get to where they are. So if we look for a second, um, uh, I mean, I know there are sort of, you know, Nick, exactly as you say, there are obviously uh, precedents, right, you know, with, with the Chinese and, and the Romans and stuff, absolutely. Um, but it's still a good question. And what's more, it's a question that's um, kind of exacerbated in the Middle Earth standpoint. If we look at the big map here, right? So the South Kingdom is down here. Um, you know, it's so basically roughly, say, Gondor plus Rohan, you know, on this map, right? And then the North Kingdom is up here, right? So here's Lake Evendim right here. Um, this over here, Linden, that's elf territory, right? And there are dwarf halls there too. Uh, so we've got some dwarves here, but it's mostly elf territory. So they, the Kingdom of Arnor, was up here in Eriador. But it wasn't really in between. This down here was always a bit of a no-man's land. The Ened Wife? Um, there was never really a... a I mean, there was a passage in between. Remember, of course, why this happened. This happened because they got separated. The ships got separated when Elendil and his, and his two sons and their people and their stuff and their... Palantiri and the Stone of Erech and everything else came across uh, from Numenor. You know, their Athales clippings and the white tree and all the other stuff that they brought with them. Uh, when, that, when they came over, um, they landed in separate places. Um, uh, uh, Isildur and Inarion landed down in Gondor, and Elendil landed up in Eriador. Um, now, this makes sense for other reasons. There were already were settlements of Numenorians. You know, the Numenorian kingdoms weren't built just off the population that came on those ships, right? Um, uh, the tall ships three times three, right? Um, the, uh, the, the, there were already large settlements of the faithful who had been emigrating from, uh, from Numenor as Sauron took control and began the charming uh, uh, practice of human sacrifice, uh, killing off the faithful. Uh, in Numenor, so that seemed to them like a good time to leave. Uh, so they had already started leaving. So many of the people who were who were the faithful and already loyal uh, to Elendo and his family were already living in Middle Earth, and uh, they were living down here. They were living at Pelargir, uh, and uh, and down here. So when uh, Isildur and Anarion come down here into the Bay of Belfalas, uh, which is where they land, there are already Numenorians here. They deliberately move north, right? They don't stay at Pelargir. Instead, they're like, Isildur in particular is like, hey, I know where I want to build my stronghold, right on the Mountains of Shadow, right? I want to, I want right cozying up against Mordor itself, right? Uh, this was Isildur biting his thumb at Sauron personally. Um, uh, Isildur seemed to be, have kind of an attitude like that. I mean, just the geographical location of Minas Ithil shows like the kind of cojones that 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 Isildur had, and the kind of attitude that he had uh, towards uh, towards Sauron as well. Um, anyway, so they built the South Kingdom with the Numenorians down there, independently of their dad, right? And you've got to think that it was a long time before Elendil and Isildur and Inarion even uh, uh, even um, uh, uh, learned that the others were alive. Right after they were separated, because Elendil lands up here. He lands up here where Gilgalad is, and there are also Numenorians up there, and they're like, hey, let's settle down next door to Gilgalad. Right? Because Gilgalad is our ally, and that'll be fun. So they, they, they settle down here, and that, notice that's just where Lake Evendim is. Right? They can sail up from the Baranduin, so that's kind of convenient. There were other settlements, right? Like uh, the great, um, the great uh, uh, harbor of Vinyalonde, uh, which was built uh, by um, by Alderian, uh, king of uh, of Numenor, and that was up here, like in the middle, like at this uh, at this like um, uh, uh, that was originally down here on the shores uh, near Enidwife, but that had been abandoned. They 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 didn't they didn't maintain that one anymore. Um, and again, the the Numenorians then moved north with Elendil to be near Gilgalad. Um, so uh, anyway, so so there they uh, uh, so there they were, 
building a basically an independent kingdom in the north and an independent kingdom in the south. And then when they discovered that they, everybody was still alive, right, they connected them with a road. So they put a road connecting them through all of the, the you know, areas, the, the wasteland in between. That's why you have this peculiar setup with the North Kingdom and the South Kingdom. Um, because, uh, again, nobody would build a kingdom that way. It's in that way, uh, Nick, right, it's very unlike the Chinese empire, very unlike the Roman empire, which was at least kind of contiguous or at least surrounding the Mediterranean, right? Which you could get to, uh, readily by sea. And so in that sense, still kind of contiguous. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so cool. Yes. And, 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 and there were roads. Exactly. Amethorn, there were definitely roads. So, so yeah, so the building of the North and South kingdoms was kind of, you know, they didn't plan it that way uh, originally, but then they joined them together when they found that they were still there. But it seemed, it's it's clear, as is, plain, as is made plain by Isildur crowning Meneldil, right, um, not just as, like, steward of Gondor, but as king in Gondor, um, they, they clearly viewed them as still functionally two separate kingdoms, but two separate kingdoms that would be joined. Right, joined really essentially in name under one high king, right, which was Isildur. But Isildur was the last one in that position, even though the title was still claimed by Isildur's heirs, uh, after all. Um, so, anyway, um, uh, yeah. Now, hey, Druid's Fire, great question. So, Druid's Fire uh, says, I've always wondered about the brick and mortar creation of the High King's Crossing in game uh, versus the carved blocks of the Argonoth. Um, yes, that is a really interesting thing about this statue, right? Is that it is made brick by brick uh, and it's not been carved out of a mountainside. Of course, there's a, a good reason for that, in that, of course, the head of Elendil, as you can see very clearly, if you can get up there, which it's kind of sad that we can't because it's a lovely view from the head of Elendil there. Uh, towers over the highest cliffs that are nearby, right? There are some, there's some high land, but even this cliffside over here, right, didn't give them enough to work with when it comes to building a colossal statue. Um, their plan here, clearly their plan, is to create a statue that would... Um, that would loom, rise up above the entire countryside, so that the head of Elendil, uh, you know, the, the crowned head of Elendil would be the, um, the, the, well, no, he doesn't wear a crown. He's got a scepter. Anyway, the head of Elendil would be the highest point in this entire region, right? Um, and that's, in fact, what they did. So, on a practical basis, it does make a lot of sense uh, that in game they would depict this as uh, built by built with blocks. Uh, they don't show where they got the blocks from, uh, because the blocks are a different color than the stone around them, right? But of course, they're the same color as the, all the buildings that we see. So where did the stone come from? Well, I'm not sure. We should look around to see if we see bluffs that are the similar color. If we can see native stone in this area that are the same color as the stones that all of these anuminous uh, houses are, are, are made of, you know, all of these old Arnorian uh, buildings and, and uh, the big huge statue. But of course, it wouldn't have to be because they could import it if they wanted to from far distant places uh, in um, Middle-earth on account of there's a navigable river here that leads up to the lake. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, Amethorn, of course, you're right. There are the Palantiri as well, right? And so in the original conception, having the Palantiri, um, they, um, um, uh, the, the North and South Kingdom would be able to communicate uh, much more quickly, right? Um even that is a little bit limited. I mean, you got to think like the Palantiri weren't exactly be weren't exactly being news just to like used to just like chew the fat with the South Kingdom, right? I mean, do do we think they came for like daily updates, like news bulletins from the South Kingdom? I doubt it, right? And even that wouldn't really enable you to it would enable the High King in Anuminus to collaborate with the king of of the South Kingdom 
right? And to talk over major matters and things, and for the, for the, you know, for Mineldu, as it was originally planned, right, for Mineldu in the south to consult Isildur in the north and see how things were going, right? But it's not like they're going to be exactly, Mariel, they're not exactly like cell phones, right? It's not like they're going to be texting each other all the time on the Palantiri uh, and, uh, you know, getting news feeds and stuff. So, the, you know, the, the practical use of the Palantiri, it seems to me, especially given that they were restricted in that way, would have been, uh, uh, would have been relatively uh, uh, limited, I would think. Um, but, uh, okay, anyway... Um, <laughs> Tony Mead says it always makes him think of the red phone in the White House. Yeah, maybe a little less doom-filled than that, but, uh, I mean, I, I can imagine maybe they would, you know, uh, call in to chat in a friendly manner occasionally, right? But, uh, uh, but probably not, um, uh, uh, but again, pr- pr- probably not on a, on a, on a, on a daily basis. Um, okay. Anyway. Okay, so let's uh, let's keep going. Let's at least look at this from a different direction. So we cross over the Baranduin here. This is the High King's Crossing, um, named that presumably for the statue of the High King that looms above it, right? Uh, rather than uh, that, it is the High Crossing of the King in the sense of it is the place where the High King crossed, right? Um, oh, uh, sorry, Tony, I didn't see that. Was it? Did you suggest this? Hang on. Oh, yeah. Somebody better kill that wolf before he munches on that dude. Um, uh, Tony suspects that the, the this stone came from the... Oh, dear. And when I say, oh, dear, I really mean it. Um, somebody must be very under level for the does to be charging in and attacking like that. Um, better keep an eye on that person. What level are you? Eleven. That would explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Keep an eye on Freida here. Hey, Freida. <laughs> this is a level 11 Freida, which is different from the other. Yeah, so watch out for the... Uh-oh. Something's coming after him again. Oh, it was that lady. I totally thought she was part of the tour. Anyway, okay. Um... <laughs> All right. So, uh, is it from Scary... I don't remember the color of the stone in Scary that clearly, but I'll I'll check that out next time I go there to see. Um, it would make sense that the quarry in Scary would pre-exist the Shire. You know that that it would be uh, it, that it could have been an old Arnorian quarry. Um, uh, that certainly seems to me plausible. But all right, let's uh, let's keep going. We'll go past the uh, the frightful deer. Notice we can see this is an old road. We do see old paving stones here. Uh, so this is clearly part of uh, part of an old Arnorian road, uh, not merely a, a more recent path. It's not exactly, it doesn't have flagstones exactly, or rather, it doesn't have cut stones. We don't see cut and carved stones as we see, uh, you know, as we see down in the south, as I was mentioning. Just looking at this statue behind, because we were looking at... Uh, Elendo from the front before, right? There he is, in his helm, with his scepter. And I suggested before, and we'll see some more of this, this, I almost said logo, this emblem up here at the top is clearly a Numenorean. That's supposed to be a ship with sails. Um, it might look like a spearhead. It might even function as a spearhead, but it's clearly not... Uh, just a spearhead. That's the 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 Numenorean symbol. But look at this second layer of um, um, statue. Well, there were two, apparently, right? Yeah. So we have these three different gates. So here we can see the lake, right, and the river coming through them. This first, which had something on top, which is broken off. We can't tell what it was. Right, and the second one has the star on both sides. So the star of Numenor, presumably, and then the third one has the High King. He's facing outward, right? So that uh, you know he's not facing inward to his kingdom. He's not facing inward to uh, to to Lake Evendim, right? Towards his capital, he is facing the river, as if to confront the people who come up the river. Um, 
uh, so it's like an introduction, right? You have come to the realm, you know, to the uh, to the heart of the realm of the High King Elendil, right? And then you pass through the star, and then you pass through something else. Um, this st- having the star over here, and then presumably again, probably it should be ships coming through. Um, then. Um, uh, uh, that's kind of lovely, right? I love the idea of ships sailing underneath the, uh, you know, this arch with the star of Numenor above it because it recreates the moment, right, of the star being placed above Numenor as they sailed, uh, you know, across the sea when when uh, uh, Numenor was initially being given to them as a gift. That's why the star is the symbol of Numenor. Um, it was called Elena, the land of the star. It's one of the names of Numenor, which has lots and lots of names, also called Andor, the land of gift, um, because the star was placed above it so that they could follow the star. Uh, and it was, of course, Arendel's star. Um, Arendel sailed through the skies above them. It's the light of the Silmaril that shines down. So when you see the star symbol in all of these uh, Numenorean sculptures and uh, buildings, and whenever you see it, remember that's the Silmaril, right? That's Arendel's star. That's Elrond's dad that's being depicted in all of those places. That's the Star of High Hope, as it was called, Gil Estel, um, which shone down upon the land of Numenor uh, to uh, to reveal it. Um and again, you kind of recapitulate that, right? It's like, this isn't Numenor, but this, as you're sailing in, the star marks, you know, Lake Evendim, right? It marks a Numinous as you come into it. And it really, therefore, makes me wonder what this must have been, what the third arch must have been. It was clearly something, right? There has to be some emblem involved. I wonder if you can see anything from the other side. I don't know. But of course, you'll notice what we begin to see right away, apart from this predatory deer who is really upset about Freyda coming in. Notice that you can see a numinous here. This is the uh, the northernmost fringes of a numinous on the south shore of the lake there that we're looking at. So you can see uh, Tulanun, uh, right, is this little island uh, stretching off to the north there of a numinous. Uh, as you can see, that's what we're seeing from here as we look down upon the lake. Um, so let's continue to look around over here and see if I can see if we can see around the front. We see another big Arnorian building up here. And yeah, Brandon, I agree. It it's it looks amazing, doesn't it? I love even dim. Um when I was when I was lower level, before I'd seen any of the, the higher uh the higher level places in the game, um Lake Evendim was my favorite place in the game. I just love the Evendim region. I think it's gorgeous and really fascinating to to, to see. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for protecting Freya there. That's very kind. Um, still can't see if we can get anything from it. Let's keep looking here. And we can see more of a Numinous there. Okay. No, I don't think we're going to get any clues there about the front of that third. I oh, can see the star really well from here. That's cool. No, apart from the fact that it clearly fits the same model as the star one, right? So it's not a person. You know, it's not like we're getting the High King facing one way and like Isildur or somebody facing the other way. It's nothing like that. Um, But um, we get the star on both sides. And then this third thing. There has to have been an emblem on it. The star one does not look like it's broken off on top. right? That is to say, this is as tall as this ever was. Which makes sense because it already comes up like you know, two-thirds of the way up Elendil's back, and you wouldn't want it to rival the height of the High King, right? Um, So it makes sense that that one would be... Which means this one is probably the same height as the Star one. What do you think? Um, Tony suggests maybe it's a sign saying thank you for visiting a (laughs) Numinous. Come again soon. Uh, Maybe. Maybe. Um, Ah, could uh, 
Uh, Katriana, that's a great idea. Katriana is suggesting in the Twitch chat that it's the Tree of Gondor uh, to, 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 to mimic the what we saw down on the paving stones, right? Both the, the tree and the star. I like that idea. Um, I mean, I think it could have, there could be something like maybe around, it could have been around thing. I mean, we can't see any reference to it or any remnants of it over here. I'm thinking maybe there could have been something on top of it instead of on the front of it, like with the star, but I don't, uh, I don't really know. Oh, Dragon Slayer Elf was just saying the same thing. And James Stevens. Well, you guys were suggesting it's a tree. Possibly. Possibly. Um, it could be a tree. In the absence of any other evidence, and uh, it's a really good question, um, there, aren't, there, there isn't any rubble down at the bottom, is there? We should check. It's worth checking, especially since we're running out of time anyway. Oh. All right, deer just got killed. Let's see. Anything down? Oh, so we're almost there to the foot of it. Let's see. Okay. The top fell. Hmm. No. I don't see any rubble. Look around the other side, but... I didn't see anything. Which, of course, you know, would make sense. You know, that's defensible not to have any rubble here because... Yeah. It's defensible, as I say, because, you know, you could imagine if a big, huge chunk of rock falls down and stuff like that, that it could have been repurposed, right, um, later on. Hey, maybe that's why the river is blocked up up here. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's the ticket. That'll work. Okay, so the top of this tower falls down into the river, and then the silt builds up around that, and that's why we've got a set of rapids here. Yep. Yep, I think uh, I think that, that makes all kinds of sense. Can we jump onto that? Probably not. Won't make it, will we? If we jump down there? Would a horse make it under there? I don't know. Anyway, I love the willows. The willows down by the riverside. It's pretty cool. Um, let's excavate, says Amethorn. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Somebody want to mount up and try it? Yeah, we do need a paraglider. Oh, well. It's fine. Um, all right. I'm not jumping just because I don't want to anticlimactically end wedged down into a crevice down there. I'd rather end our field trip from this beautiful view. Hey! Well, she made it. She fell off the other end, but she made it over. That's cool. Um... Okay, there you go. All right, let's give it a shot. Ready? Let's do this. Let's mount up. There we go. Nice. Sweet. Excellent. Great view. All right, so we will move on towards the Numinous... And that other place over there, which, of course, that's Tinadir, uh, which is the camp through which many of you will have come here. So we'll see how that plays out here, but uh, we'll have to spend some time looking at Anuminus. We'll definitely need to protect lower-level folks there, as Anuminus is a fairly dangerous place to be. But we'll keep going. Also, of course, we're going to take a break from our exploration of Evendim in order to return back to the plot line, right? Uh, we have uh, the old forest to explore when we get into the old forest. Um, but we can probably do our, our field trip of the old forest pretty much in one class, I think. And my suspicion is we're going to be in the old forest for more than one class uh, when it comes to uh, uh, talking about the story. So, anyway. Cool. Excellent. Well... 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining me. I'll let you guys go here this evening. Um, but, uh, uh, but I appreciate your being with me here tonight. I look forward to our continued discussion next week as we go through, again, hopefully the end of Chapter 5, and then probably some more, uh, uh, some more even dim exploration uh, and thinking through what we're seeing here uh, in uh, the even dim region and around Enuminous uh, for next time. So thanks very much, everybody. And I will. Oh, next week, by the way, we're on Landreval. So uh, back on Landreval, my home server uh, for next week's class. Thanks a lot, everybody. And I will see you guys next week. Bye now.